So it is with absolute pleasure right now that I introduce Frank Bruni to come out and give the closing remarks for our symposium today. Frank Bruni has been an op-ed columnist for the New York Times since 2011. He previously worked as the newspaper's Rome bureau chief, Sunday Magazine staff writer, one of its White House correspondents, and as its chief restaurant critic. Bruni is the author of two best-selling books, the memoir Born Round and a chronicle of George W. Bush's 2000 presidential campaign, Ambling into History, as well as the recently released Where You Go Is Not Who You'll Be, an antidote to the college admissions mania. And immediately following his talk today, he'll be up in the lobby signing his book. So welcome, Frank Bruni. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope everyone's had a good day, and I won't go on too long because I know it's been a long day. Um, Thank you for uh, letting me have the microphone in this bit of time. Uh, I want to start by telling you two stories as a lead-in um, to the state we're in today in this country in terms of college admissions. The first one, I, uh, about a year and a half ago, I had the incredible privilege uh, of, teach, of being asked to teach a writing seminar at Princeton. You've probably heard of Princeton. And some, some of you probably have it at the top of your list of dream schools. And it's a fantastic school that's worth being at the top of anybody's list. Um, I was asked in particular to teach a food writing course. So you can, as you can imagine, the interest far exceeded the ability to accommodate the number of people. It was limited to 16 students, as seminars of its kind are. Um, and uh, there were so many people interested, they asked each of them to write a long letter of application that would show me a little bit of their writing style, tell me a little bit about them, um, and then I would choose from those letters. 48 kids took the trouble to submit these letters. And I remember very well the long afternoon I spent uh, downloading them and reading them and how impressed and excited I was because they had so much verve, so much polish, and I thought there's no way I'm going to be able to choose 16 out of these 48. Um, in the end, my choices were almost random. It was that difficult. The semester began, um, and about halfway through the semester, as I downloaded the latest batch of papers that I'd assigned and began reading them and being a little bit disappointed by many of them, I thought to myself, this doesn't make sense. I'm pretty sure that these kids wrote better in their application letter than they're doing in this class. Um, I was so intrigued by this that I actually went back, I found my file of application letters, I read the 16 of the kids who'd come to the class, um, and more than half of them had never written anything quite as good for the class halfway through the semester as they'd written to get into the class or to try to get into the class. I began asking every professor I got to know at Princeton, what do you make of this? Isn't this extraordinary? Not one of them was the least bit surprised. And all of them said some version of the following. These young men and women are at Princeton in this era of the 7% acceptance rate because they've learned to excel at getting into things and because we've given them the message that getting in is the greatest quest and the greatest accomplishment. And in their minds, because of this frenzied, anxious world of admissions we've created, once they got in, their greatest work was done. It mattered more to get through the door than what you did once you were in the room. The other story I want to tell you uh, is not a personal experience, but as I was working on my book, I talked to many people at many different kinds of schools, and I had a fascinating conversation uh, with a man who teaches psychology lectures at Cornell. Um, and we were talking about all the status consciousness in colleges today and how people um, aspire to a certain level and get upset if they don't go there. And he said that every year, um, when he teaches his 200 student introductory psychology lecture, um, he asks the same question. Now, I should pause here and tell you his class is not freshmen, not a single freshman in it. These are sophomores, juniors, and seniors. So all of these young men and women are at least a year, and in most cases, two or three years beyond the college admissions juncture. And he asks them, would everybody who's upset that they're not at Yale, Harvard, or Princeton please raise their hand? And he said year after year, about 60, six zero percent of the students raise their hands. They are several years past the admissions process, as I said. They're at Cornell University, and they're still haunted by what might have been and what they didn't get. Both of those stories, in different ways, reflect our ridiculously widespread belief that the brightness of your future hinges on the exclusiveness of the college you get into, and that the lower, your, the, lower the acceptance rate, the surer and smoother your path through life is going to be. 
That is absolutely not true, and that's what I'm going to talk about in largest part today. Um, there's some evidence to support it for sure, but there's just as much evidence against it. And the reason that young people believe this is because we selectively edit reality and the way we talk about it in a way that fosters and perpetuates this myth. So if you think about it, when you are introduced to or you introduce someone of great accomplishment and in that man or woman's background is an elite school, you tend to mention it. If you introduce someone who doesn't have such a school in his or her background, you often leave it out. And the message sent by that is that the elite school explains the success, but the non-elite school is incidental rather than instrumental. I notice this very, very vividly in the coverage that we, the media, give you of the presidential race. So let's talk about the Republican field since it's about 100 people large. We've got a lot of, it's a big sample so. If you left here and you Googled Ted Cruz and you downloaded profiles written of him that were of a sufficient length that they get into some detail, I guarantee you nine out of 10, if not 10 out of 10 of those profiles would mention that he went to Princeton as an undergrad and that he went to Harvard Law. And they would probably mention it fairly early in the profile. If you did the same exercise for Bobby Jindal, the governor of Louisiana, who is also running for president, although you wouldn't know it from his poll numbers, you would find out very quickly from most of these profiles that he went to Brown and that he was a Rhodes Scholar. But if you then did this for Chris Christie, you might not learn from many of these profiles that he went to the University of Delaware and then to the Seton Hall Law School. If you did the same exercise for Marco Rubio, whom I can tell you is one of the most um, policy fluent, smooth speaking of any of these candidates, you would not find out from any of the profiles that he started college at a place called Tarkio in Missouri that sort of doesn't even exist as a full-fledged college anymore, then ended up at a community college and only after that went to the University of Florida. Those details are seen as irrelevant or even contradictory of success when in fact they may have as much to do with who these people became as anything else. Jeb Bush is running for president. He's supposed to be the brainy brother. But you almost never hear that he went to the University of Texas. When George W. Bush was running, you heard constantly that he went to Yale and then the Harvard Business School. It's another example of what I'm talking about. When you will, you will read many articles that will note that every Supreme Court justice was touched by Ivy, went through the Ivy League in some form, either undergraduate or for law school. You will never read that only about one in three US senators went to a school that you would consider highly selective, that only about one in four American governors went to a school that you would consider highly selective. We don't find that interesting, but we find the Ivy monopoly stuff utterly, utterly fascinating. Um, when I look around me at my fellow op-ed columnists. I see some Ivy. Nick Kristoff went to Harvard. Um, David Brooks went to University of Chicago, another reach dream school. But my friends Maureen Dowd and Gail Collins went respectively to Catholic University and Marquette University. Joe Nocero went to Boston University. Charles Blow went to Grambling State. And Tom Friedman, in all his international wisdom, began at a good state school, the University of Minnesota. How many of you have heard of the MacArthur Foundation? most everyone or a lot of you, they hand out what are known as genius grants. And they're called that because they're given to the, most, the brightest, most promising artists, writers, academicians. About two dozen are handed out every year, each is worth about $625,000 now. Um, and I looked at just the last couple of years, so we're not talking about a big sample set. And sure enough, I saw some of the schools you would expect to see there. But here's some of the other schools in this relatively small sample set that I also saw. These are where the MacArthur Genius Grant winners went to undergraduate. State University of New York at Purchase, SUNY Albany, Louisiana State, Villanova, University of Kansas, University of Cincinnati, Coker College, Columbus State University, University of Illinois, University of Maryland. I discussed all of that in my book and after its publication I heard from the MacArthur Foundation, they were so intrigued by that, they decided to go back and look at all 1900, I'm sorry, all 900 and 18 winners in the history of the grant and see where they went to school. And they sent me the list. The backgrounds of these winners, their alma maters, their undergraduate alma maters, included Western Michigan University, Western Illinois University, Southern Illinois University, Illinois Wesleyan University. San Diego State University had produced two MacArthur winners 
as had San Francisco State University. The MacArthur people wrote to me, one in five fellows graduated from institutions with acceptance rates of over 50%. 15 graduated from either historically black colleges and universities or tribal colleges, and 44 from women's colleges. 40 graduated from religiously affiliated institutions. Several began their studies at community colleges. My point is an incredibly obvious one, but I make it because as obvious as it is, we let it get obscured by the college frenzy and our obsession with elite universities, which is that there are any number of paths to great success, and even more importantly, to a happy life. And we do kids an enormous disservice when we give them the impression that the better paths are the ones that have acceptance rates below 10%, 25%, or even below 40%. There are many different ways that college can serve you, and there are many different kinds of colleges that can serve you well, and you can't plot it all out precisely, which is everyone's temptation. I want to tell you two stories that illustrate that. One, a man who grew up here in Brooklyn, this is many years ago, in a very poor neighborhood, um, didn't really know how he'd get to college or how he'd afford it. And because he played football and played it fairly well and happened to be seen by a recruiter, he ended up at Northern Michigan University. Before he went there, he'd only been out of New York State once. Before he went there, he'd never really met anybody from the Midwest. He'd never, met, he'd never been to a rural area. This was completely alien to him. He was alien enough to the people he went to college with, that for many of them was the first time they'd ever met a Jewish person. He says that this was an incredible experience for him because he had to learn right away to be extraordinarily independent. He needed to learn how to build bridges to people with whom he didn't have an automatic connection. He had to learn how to be sort of fluent in diversity um, in a way that some people don't. He believes all these things were as useful to his career as any classroom work could have been. The gentleman I'm describing is Howard Schultz, the chairman, president, and chief executive of Starbucks. Somebody else I'd like to introduce you to along these lines. She grew up in the Denver area, uh, and because she was precocious, and she finished school very early at a young age, and because she had extremely hovering, overprotective parents, they weren't called helicopter parents then, but they would be now, um, she, uh, they gave her a choice. They didn't want her far out of their sight. They told her she could go to Colorado College, or she could go to the University of Denver. She chose the University of Denver because it had a good conservatory, and she was sure that she was going to grow up and become a professional musician. She got to college. She learned, as many people do, that she wasn't quite as good as she thought she was at what she thought she was so good at. Um, so she began to look for something else. She wandered around campus. She happened to take a course in uh, international affairs from a gentleman named Joseph Corbell, who's the father of a woman named Madeleine Albright. She would go on, Madeleine Albright, as many of you have already gone there in your own heads, to be the Secretary of State in the Clinton administration. And uh, the student I'm describing, who took a class from her father, her first international affairs course, and then went down that road, would end up being the Secretary of State for George W. Bush. I'm describing to you Condoleezza Rice. She now teaches at Stanford, and when she and I were talking about all of this, she said, my students will come in and say, how do I do what you do? which means they want to be Secretary of State. <laughs> I say, so here's how you do it. You start as a failed piano major. <laughs> They're stunned, but what I'm trying to get them to see is that you have some time to recognize that special combination of what you love and what you're also good at. Taking the time to do that is very important. Um, I was able to eavesdrop on a number of panels today, so I know you've all heard from some terrific counselors, admissions deans, educators, and I don't pretend to have the kind of inside or insider's glimpse into the admissions process that they do. But the perspective I bring you is from somebody who has met and gotten to know a ridiculously broad range of successful people along with their backgrounds. I've been, in the three decades that I've been in journalism, I've been a religion reporter, a campaign reporter, a medical reporter, a White House correspondent, a war correspondent, a foreign correspondent, a Vatican correspondent. That's interesting. <laughs> a movie critic, a restaurant critic, and now an op-ed columnist. My little brother tells me I do not have a journalism career. I have an attention deficit disorder. <laughs> 
My point is I have studied and learned the biographies of hundreds of extremely successful people across scores of disciplines. And when I grill myself on what they have in common, it's not passage as an undergraduate through an elite institution. It's not a diploma that makes people get weak in the knees. It's resourcefulness, um, it's ingenuity, um, above all, it's complete engagement in the things they do and then the work ethic that goes along with that. None of those things is the province of a school with an acceptance rate of under 20%. Um, since everybody's giving advice today and since you guys all gave me the microphone for a short time, I'm gonna give a bunch of advice humbly and for whatever it's worth. Do not choose a school because it's going to flatter you and do not get overly invested in the name of a school. You show, you show me somebody who's leaning on the name of the school they attended five, 10 years after they graduated, I'll show you somebody who's in professional trouble. You show me somebody who's doing it 10 years after that and I'll show you someone who's in big, big trouble. The longer you, the longer you travel, the farther you travel from college, the less and less where you went to school is going to mean. And every adult in this room knows that, and yet we somehow do not communicate that to kids who are getting so anxious and so nervous and who really, really need to hear it. Do not choose a school because it's where your friends are going, and do not choose it only because it's going to make you comfortable. Um, there are many ways to think of fit. And one way a school can be a good fit is that it's going to discomfort you. It's going to unsettle you. There's an element of learning that should be unsettling and provocative. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from. I went to a Northeastern prep school, and I uh, dreamed of and was lucky enough to get into Yale early action. Then a twist happened, and I was offered a full merit scholarship to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. One, there were many reasons, including money, um, that I went to University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, although money wasn't the main reason. It felt to me at the time, and I don't know how I had the sense to think this, that Yale would be much more familiar to me. It would be full of people who'd come from Northeastern prep schools like my own. It was in the state I grew up in. It was just an hour down the road. Whereas North Carolina would be full of people whom I hadn't met in a region of the country that I didn't know, more socioeconomically diverse, and all of those things. I am sure I would have had a fantastic education, a great time, and met extraordinary people at Yale. I had a fantastic education, a great time, and met extraordinary people at the University of North Carolina, which I think allowed me to color farther outside the lines of my life to that point than Yale would have done. You can think about choosing a school that's gonna complete you, it's not to sound too Jerry Maguire, and fill in the, <laughs> oh good, some people got that. It's a favorite movie. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I mean, you can, you can approach the idea of what the right college is for you by thinking about what is going to fill in the blanks of who you are. One of the stories I came across in doing the book that I found most interesting was of a young man who'd grown up in a very peculiar circumstance in uh, Morocco, small English language school there, and he was, by his own description, a computer nerd. When it came time to decide where to go to school, his choices were Carnegie Mellon, which he saw as a prestigious place that would flatter him, or Penn State University, which he saw as having less cachet. He felt that at Carnegie Mellon, he would not be pulled out of what he described as his computer nerd self. And he thought, you know, I'm good at science, I've got the computer thing down pat, but what I need to be better at is moving among large groups of people, um, is kind of communicating with people, um, being, being socially interesting, being socially vivid, all those things Howard Schultz talked about getting out of Northern Michigan. So he went to Penn State. He focused not just on his classroom work, but on becoming that kind of gregarious, charismatic person. When he graduated in 2006, um, as he suspected, he wanted to start a business and he needed those sorts of leadership and communication skills. He and two friends did start a tech venture, a tech startup. It's called Weebly. That was in 2006, last year it was valued at $450 million. Um, and I don't say that because money is the only measure of success, but a lot of you do worry, am I going to be able to afford a comfortable, secure life for myself? And so that's one of the reasons why I cite, I cite metrics like that. Um, take at least half, although I'd prefer it if it were two thirds, of the time you are poised to spend worrying about how to get into college 
and lavish it instead on worrying about how you're going to use whichever college you get into. When I talk to people who are most satisfied with their college experiences, what they talk about is the way they wrung what they needed to get out of the colleges they went to. This, every college is a landscape, or almost every college is a landscape that's going to be more varied, larger than the one you came from in high school. And if you don't pause to survey it and see everything it could offer and decide what you're going to get and make sure to get it, you are wasting an extraordinary chapter of life and an enormous amount of money to boot. Remember that who you are right now and what an admissions committee says to you is no harbinger of the future and is no definition of who you are and has nothing to do with who you could become. Everybody hits their stride at a different point in life. And the whole reason we have the phrase late bloomer is because so many people don't hit their stride until later on in the game. Um, a gentleman I interviewed for the book was telling me that he was not much of a high school student. At his private school in Birmingham, Alabama, he had a 2.9 GPA. Um, his SATs were not very good, and interestingly, he did better on the math part than the other, given what would become of him. Um, he didn't try to apply to any dream schools or what other kids thought of as dream schools. He was fortunate, in his own estimation, to get into Kenyon, which is a great school, but when he applied, had a 50% acceptance rate. So it was accepting one out of every two kids. It didn't feel like an enormous accomplishment to him. Even when he got to Kenyon, he didn't hit his stride. He took an introductory writing class. He loved it, thought he'd done really well, but when he went to sign up for the intermediate class, even though he only had to beat out three other kids to get the 12 spots for the 15 people who'd applied, he was told, no, you're not in because you didn't do well enough in the early class. If he had taken the college admissions juncture, or even his first year and a half at Kenyon, as a judgment on what he could do in life, he would not have stuck with the writing, he would not have gone on. The, the gentleman I'm describing to you is named John Green. He's the author of The Fault in Our Stars and one of the most successful young adult novelists of our time. Everybody blossoms at a different point, and all the chips are not on this one moment. Lastly, do not take college for granted. Everyone who's applying to college with good faith that they're going to get in somewhere, with good faith that they're going to be able to swing it financially, whether it's, whether it's because their parents have the means or whether because they're going to be able to take out loans or whatever, is already ahead of the game. We have done an extraordinary disservice to a generation of kids because we've taken a phrase that when I was growing up, even though there was plenty of anxiety, had such kind of promise and wonder to it, going to college. That was such an exciting phrase, going to college. And we've turned it for so many kids in this generation into a source of dread and anxiety, something they want to get through rather than something that's going to be the great, great adventure of their lives. Um, that's a shame. Um, and as you go through the college application process, do not lose sight of the fact that wherever you end up, you are poised for one of the greatest adventures of your life, life and you are ahead of the game. Um, lastly, and I know it's come up before, do not give overdue weight to the rankings of US News and World Report. <laughs> I think everybody has said that. Um, it cannot be said enough. Like all rankings, they're subjective. Like all rankings, they can be manipulated. Like all rankings, they're incomplete, and they make value judgments about what's important. They, for instance, don't give any heed to the socioeconomic diversity of a university in an era when we know that one's ability to manage diversity in life is both a key to happiness and to success. And um, since I don't want to go on too much longer, I'll leave you with this. In September of 2014, the Washington Post did a profile of Bob Morse, the man chiefly responsible for the US News and World Report rankings. The writer was smart enough to ask him point blank what he thought was the relevance of a college's reputation to a student's future. And this was the answer of the man chiefly responsible for those infernal rankings. It's not where you went to school, it's how hard you work. I uh, finished the profile and then I did a little more research. Bob Morse did his undergraduate work at the University of Cincinnati and he got his MBA from Michigan State University. Thank you very much.